The first national power shift in seven years took place in Ottawa, Canada this past February 13 to 18, 2019, and I, Urgi Insatoris, co-founder and executive director at Green Seeds Music Society, got to join a group of young adults sponsored by the David Suzuki Foundation to attend as part of their commitment to climate action and movement building. We bunked together in a shared Airbnb, shared rides to and from sessions and keynote speeches, and debriefed late into the night on all topics related to the climate crisis, including elections, municipal actions, social justice, decolonization, divestment, health, and more. Youth have always brought energy to movements. Power Shift, as one of the roomies put it, was an inception of organizers organizing for other organizers to spur more organizing. And a schedule is jam-packed. I'll be highlighting takeaways from my top three workshops attended. For day one at PowerShift, the opening plenary had First Nation elders share their stories of residential school and family trauma. They urged the need to protect and preserve water as an essential life source. My key takeaways were, let's work on upgrading society so that it's environmentally friendly and emissions free. To do this, we need to share knowledge and band together. We're here to build a strong, powerful movement. For this, we need to make relationships and share tools and strategies for keeping fossil fuels in the ground. There's a need to reconfigure or change capitalism, a need to push for the respect of Indigenous rights. Workshop favorite number one involved municipal responses to climate change. Organizer Powerhouse's Lily Barraclaw and Sharita Henry with iMatterYouth.org hosted this workshop which I was inspired to attend after having been to a Richmond, BC City Council meeting held on February 11, 2019, in which the motion to declare a climate emergency was initially deferred but later carried by unanimous vote on Monday, March 25, 2019. My key takeaways were that, that we need bold, courageous emergency action on a local, state and national scale. Municipalities can move faster on climate change issues. The goal is to get young people going out into their communities. It's not totally perfect in engaging everyone who needs to be engaged, however. In order to take back elections, we need to recognize that we're in a political moment. How do we reach voters? Keeping in mind that organizing is about relationships. We all move around based on where we can afford to live. It's helpful to talk about how a very small amount of people are screwing all of us over. Workshop favor number two was global decolonization is needed. Here I learned that the countries most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change are the ones who were colonized. Canada is a deeply imperialist nation, responsible for the mining and dispossession of resources in countries such as Venezuela. These regions in the world cannot respond to the climate crisis because of colonial political destabilization. This connection with the land is the culprit. When people are no longer on the land that their ancestors were on, when they are displaced, they will not have the connection to the land that would be helpful in responding to climate change. The global north perpetuates colonization. We are all facing the brunt of climate impacts. It's deeply rooted in liberation of colonialization on a global scale. Canada is complicit in many ways beyond fossil fuels. Even if tomorrow Canada was clean, justice is still an issue. It's important to have climate accountability for adaptation and loss and damage. Canada and the US have resisted adding language to UN agreements for this. Canada is not only made an economic model that benefits from resources, but one that also profits from war, the elimination of borders, and fights to prevent migration. A Green New Deal in Canada would need to attack free trade, migration, homelessness, and the economic system on which this country is based. If it's not a complete system change, it's going to mean nothing. Climate change is an intersectional issue. It needs decolonization on a global scale. Green capitalism is not going to save us. Renewable energy technology relies on free trade. We need to fundamentally change capitalism. A Green New Deal needs to recognize that it brings a lot of good, but still needs to improve in many areas. We're in this for the long haul though, to unlearn, relearn, and re-talk about these issues. We need spaces to build on the logistics and tactics of struggle. We need to decide how much power will it take to change everything. We need everyone to do what? How are we going to deal with keeping our communities safe? How are we going to feed ourselves? For my favorite workshop number three, I attended a Green New Deal in Canada along with my other roomies. My key takeaways here and questions from this were, we're trying hard to make change happen, so what is working? Aren't there millions of people in this movement? Why are we losing? Is this framework useful? Can we all use it to pull in the same direction? Could we all have the same organizing method? A way in which we organize struggle? If we need everyone, how are we going to involve them? We're going to miss another moment if this doesn't electrify a culture shift. We need to bring people together across cultural divides. So, how do we talk to our people? We need to organize the people. We need to arc in a new direction towards a climate movement looking to transform the left, 
as we can't build new pipelines. We need to bring multiple issues together as a single focus. Not all climate action is created equal. Climate change magnifies oppression, so we need justice, equal justice, migrant justice. Currently, no government or entity is big enough to tackle this. Similar movements such as Black Lives Matter, immigration, women's rights, youth climate strike movements are getting louder and coming together. We need to envision these movements claiming space and angling their work towards a movement of movements that is more broad. How can the climate movement play its best role? People of color are disproportionately affected and alienated. Building a multiracial movement will require having a culture between groups. We need a new story for the climate movement, one that allows people to show up as themselves, one that provides support of other movements collaborating and supporting the work of the severity of the climate issue, an intersectional issue. In conclusion, PowerShift 2019 reinforced the importance of community organizing and of the need to focus on how to change capitalism through tools such as the Green New Deal in Canada, industrial policy shifting to make renewables cheap and widely used, and environmental law, protection of clean air, land and water for all in Canada and beyond. The push is on for youth to raise hell, but how do we get laws to change overnight? Emergency laws can be put into action by any country in the world overnight, says Polly Higgins, author of Eradicating Ecocide. I came away thinking that there needs to be a greater push for intersection and relationships between Indigenous peoples, environmentalists, lawyers who are working on international ecocide laws, and doctors who are rarely referenced at talks and events, but who deal heavily in the health effects of the climate crisis. The power is rising amongst the youth. Corporations and the governments they control have had their heyday. It's now time to unite with Indigenous peoples in protecting and preserving clean air, water and soil. We must rebuild a relationship with the sacred. The majority of people on earth are displaced peoples who must rebuild the relationship to the land. Colonialism and its evolution, globalization, are stripping life from the planet. We have 10 years to turn us around to maintain a livable home. We are the earth. Everything that surrounds us is interdependent and interrelated. Thank you. I'll leave you with a snippet of one of my favorite keynote speeches by Ariel the Ranger. We have a role in this country to ensure that we're not just paying lip service to Indigenous peoples and Indigenous peoples' rights, but that we actually talk about decolonization, which is giving the land back to Indigenous people and connecting back to the land and where we come from. We're talking about trying to keep global temperatures two degrees below pre-industrial levels. And in Canada's north, they're already at 1.6 degrees higher than pre-industrial levels. 1.8 probably this year. So we're already butting up against that number. The people in Canada's Arctic and the circumpolar Arctic of the world are really feeling this. The people of the Pacific Islands are really feeling this. And we talk about it as if it's something that's going to happen. But the reality is, is we're already in it. What's really key and what's really critical is to think 80% of the world's biodiversity exists with Indigenous peoples' territory. But we aren't sitting at the tables to create Canada's climate policies or even the provincial policies. We're relegated to discussions about how to implement solar energy, not talking about Indigenous laws of the land, not talking about those traditional systems that existed before contact when we had relationships with our natural world given to corporations to decide what reclamation standards look like, what biodiversity reclamation is going to look like. This is literally what they call equivalent land use capacity. The degradation isn't just from the mines themselves, but the degradation has multiple generational effects. That is, now it's not just in my territory. This is where I'm going to get into more neoliberalism. The tar sands exist and are expanding across like cancer across the continent of North America and Turtle Island with pipelines. So we have to start talking about and tackling the core fundamental issues. The disempowerment of indigenous peoples to govern our lands and territories. We have to talk about corporatocracy. We have to talk about that these corporations are dictating the social policies and the climate policies that we are putting forward, and we're not going to be able to fight every single pipeline unless we are able to stop the Alberta tar sands.